Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Stephen Cleary. This is the talk on asynchronous streams. So if this wasn't the talk you were expecting, now is a great time to leave. Uh, I'm a Microsoft MVP, and I work a lot with asynchronous code. I also wrote a book. Uh, so uh, the second edition just came out uh, from O'Reilly. And sometimes I, I'm known as the other Stephen, because there's a Stephen Tobe inside of Microsoft who invent, or I shouldn't say invented, but he, he was on the team that worked on a lot of the asynchronous parallel code. And then I'm the other Stephen, the one who doesn't work for Microsoft. I just talk about the asynchronous stuff. I didn't invent it. But I want to talk uh, about asynchronous streams today, which is something that is fairly new. Um, before we dive into that, just a real quick history on the asynchronous invasion, as I call it, uh, Microsoft being the first uh, to adopt the async and await keywords, but they didn't just stay within the Microsoft language community. Uh, C Sharp was one of the first, TypeScript, another Microsoft language, and then eventually uh, Python also jumped on, and also JavaScript. Uh, async and await is now officially part of JavaScript, has been for a couple of years now. And I find it interesting, just, just as a side note, that async and await being uh, something developed by Microsoft has also been accepted by so many other different languages that all follow very different language design systems. So we've got C Sharp and TypeScript. This is one company, Microsoft, saying this is what's in the language. And then we have Python, which is a very community developed language with their Python enhancement proposals and all that kind of thing, uh, where you have uh, the, the people deciding what we want in our language. And then we have JavaScript, which is uh, you know, the ECMAScript board being um, all these different companies, browser vendors, language vendors, uh, like Microsoft, and, and coming together saying, this is what we want in an international standard for our language. And so these are very, three very different styles of developing languages, and yet all of them have adopted async and await uh, in a very, very similar way, which I think is very telling. And we are also coming into asynchronous generators um, that are being added now. Python was actually the first one to adopt these. I think uh, the Python story is kind of funny because they, they came out with, they adopted async and await, and then they're like, you know what, this actually works really well with our generator syntax. So we're going to go ahead and do asynchronous streams, or asynchronous generators, as they are known in that language. And TypeScript also adopted it. JavaScript also adopted it last year. And just recently, it officially became part of the C Sharp language, the C Sharp version 8, which was released recently, uh, a month or two ago. Uh, with the new language, uh, we can use async streams. They're built right into .NET Core 3 or newer. Uh, so for our future development, uh, they're already in .NET Core. There's also a. Um, a NuGet package that you can install to make it work on .NET Framework Full. If anybody is still uh, maintaining any .NET Full Framework apps, I have lots of them to maintain, so this makes me happy. <laughs> now, this talk, we're mostly talking about the C-sharp version, but I do want to talk a little bit about other languages along the way. I, just, I love uh, programming languages. Actually, the last week or two, I've been learning all about uh, hooks, React hooks in JavaScript, and yeah, just just. I, I love the hooks, uh, learning about that kind of thing and what other languages are doing as well. But this is a .NET conference. We're talking mainly about C Sharp. We'll, we'll mention some of these other languages along the way. So real quickly, let's talk about why. Why we would want asynchronous streams. Well, be, before we even ask why asynchronous streams, why use asynchrony at all, uh, these are the common um, benefits that you can get from async and await, or, or any kind of asynchronous code, actually. On the client side, you get responsiveness. The whole idea is that you're freeing up your UI thread to be more responsive to your user. This is any kind of uh, GUI application or, or like a mobile application. And on the server side, you get greater scalability. You're freeing up threads so that your server can handle more requests and also handle bursting traffic much better as well. Now, the key thing about, uh, about the benefits here is that they both come from the same core idea, and that is freeing up threads. Asynchronous code is a way to not use a thread. It's to do something, uh, do something else 
uh, with your thread while the asynchronous operation is ongoing. So this explains why we would want asynchronous code. Now, asynchronous code has actually been around for a long, long time. I don't know exactly, but I'm thinking probably like the 60s would be about when the asynchro first asynchronous code was, was being written, um, 1960s, <laughs> so a long time ago. And .NET has actually supported asynchronous code right from the very beginning. But it was never easy. No company ever, ever decided, oh, we're going to make all our code asynchronous because that's just, of course, the way we should do it. No, uh, it, it, was, it was so hard to write. Uh, back in those days. And it never really became possible to write maintainable asynchronous code until async and await came on the scene, which is why I think it's spread across all these different languages now, and it's continuing to spread also. So we had things in the past like callbacks and, and uh, you know, like the Node.js style of callbacks, and then the promises style of writing, which is more like client-side JavaScript, and then now the modern async and await, which is the next step in, in bringing maintainable asynchronous code into a reality. So that's like the history of async and await, how it's spreading through different languages, why, why everyone is adopting it. Let's take a look at asynchronous streams specifically. Now there's, I, I find three different uh, common approaches to asynchronous streams when you're thinking about would I want this in my code. And one of the most common ones is Enumerables. Actually, I would say this is the second most common. Um, so why have asynchronous streams? We're going to compare asynchronous streams against enumerables here. If we have an enumerable, and I mean something like an iterator block or a generator block, uh, our enumerables are, are always synchronous. If you're doing link today in pre.NET Core 3, it's always going to be synchronous. Um, I, leaving aside reactive extensions for the moment. We'll talk about that in a minute. But link to objects, uh, and even link to SQL, and link to entities, these are all synchronous uh, systems. So you know, we're, we're, in, we're writing this code. We're writing link code. And we're writing synchronous enumerable code. But we also know that there's this other part of the language that's async and await now. Well, we have the ability to do asynchronous code. I want to be able to make a, an enumerator that can give me things asynchronously. Right? So we want to be able to do this kind of asynchronous work during an enumeration. Another perspective here is coming from the task perspective. This is where we've got code that is using async and await. But now we want to return multiple values. Now, of course, with the task, you can return like a list or something like that. But the, the, the core problem here is that tasks only complete once. They can complete with, a, with an error or a result or a cancellation, but they only complete once. What we want to be able to do is say, OK, here's one value, and then sometime later, here's another value. We want to generate these multiple results asynchronously, not all at the same time. So this is, I think, the more common perspective of why use asynchronous streams. And then finally, there's a much less common uh, perspective. And this is for people who are using observables. Just, I have to ask here, does anybody use observables today? Anybody, reactive extensions? OK. That's, a, that's about, uh, about average, just 2% or so, 5% um, maybe. Um, so most people don't use reactive extensions. Um, and, the, and then I think the reason is because it's not really a natural mental fit for the language. So we do have this kind of thing here that is uh, asynchronous and multi-valued, so it's just like what we wanted before. We can now define a, a stream that is asynchronous and gives us values now and then another one later. But we want something that has a more natural consumption aspect. When you're in the reactive extensions world, you usually have to, have to just add on operators to the end. It's, it's, it's difficult to get out of that monad. So we're looking for something like we can use for each with. You know, you can't use for each with an observable. And the reason here is, you know, it's, it's, it's easier to learn, right? And we, these other things, enumerables and tasks that are also in the language, that are part of the language, they have a natural consumption. Enumerables we can consume with for each. Um, tasks and, and other promises we can consume with await. So they have a very natural consumption built right into the language. Now, this one. Um, 
This one is less common in the .NET world. Actually, observables are, which I find interesting because observables started in .NET. They've been much more broadly adopted by the JavaScript community. And I think that the reason behind that is that, is that the threading is simpler in JavaScript. You only have one thread. So there's, there's no problem with uh, learning observables in JavaScript. They're easier to learn. They're easier to reason about. And I think that's why they aren't as widely adopted in C Sharp. So what we want is like some kind of a, of a way to write the code, or to, to do something like observables, but that is more integrated nicely with the language. It's easier to use, easier to consume. And really, that code that I'm talking about there, when I talk about natural consumption, what I really mean is, is a pull-based system. With observables, it's a push-based system. So when you have an observable stream, you, define, you subscribe to that stream, and then that stream will send you uh, the, the data. The stream will throw the data at you. And in everything else that we're talking about here, um, using tasks, using enumerables, it's all pull-based, right? So, so when we're, when we're for-eaching over any kind of enumerable, any kind of link, uh, that we, we are pulling the results out one at a time. So really, when we're talking about natural consumption, something that fits more naturally in the language, we're actually wanting something that is pull-based. So here's a, a summary of how async enumerable compares to these different technologies, or asynchronous streams. Compared to, to regular enumerables, uh, asynchronous enumerables are, of course, asynchronous. Uh, compared to tasks, instead of just one value, we can get out multiple values over time. And instead of a push-based observable, we can do something that is pull-based, that's more natural with a language, easier to consume. So when we're thinking about what kind of types we want to expose on our API, uh, asynchronous enumerables fit right in with any time we want to return multiple values asynchronously. This is different than observables, where, which are pull-based, or push-based, sorry. So these asynchronous streams, they, they complement these existing approaches. They don't really replace any of them. Uh, asynchronous enumerables do not replace enumerables or, ta or task for asynchronous code or observables. They complement them. So let's take a look at actual asynchronous streams. Uh, we, this is the, the very short summary here. You can now use await and yield return in the same method. All right, another show of hands. Has anybody ever used yield return? OK, good. That's most of the room. All right, believe it or not, a lot of developers actually have it. It's, it's kind of a, a, an unusual thing to work with and an unusual mental model. So I'm going to take a, a demo here. And I'll see that. All right. So just a, a real brief demo. I'm going to write, just to, to, just to illustrate how yield return works first, there's one particular component that I want to bring out here with this uh, yield return. So we're going to come in here. We're going to take, uh, we're going to call this method. It's going to return an enumerable. And it's going to return three values. And then we're going to pull each of those values out one at a time using a for each. Very basic stuff, but I want to, to point out one thing. So when we hit this, this breakpoint, we have already called yield, ret we've called yield return. Now we're returning that first value. That first value gets returned and is written out into the console write line. We got one. All right, and then we come back in. We got two. Oops. We got two, and then it calls back in again to yield return three. Now, what's interesting here is that this method is being paused. Right? The yield return actually causes the compiler to, uh, to introduce a state machine here. So this, this method is actually being broken up into sections. And at each point where there's a yield return, it, uh, it now returns a new value in that enumerable. And when we call back into this method, it has all of its local state and everything right there. Now, that's only local state. If we oh, can't really see that very well. 
But the, the call stack here is not the incomplete call stack. Uh, when we resume a, an enumerable method, that call stack is not captured. It's not the whole call stack. It's really just the local state for that method gets lifted out of that method, put on the, put on the heap instead of on the stack. And then we have the ability to resume executing that method. But we don't have the entire call stack there. We call back into that method from somewhere else. So that's, that's the, uh, the core idea behind enumerables. And just to illustrate this, um, we also have this code. This is, so the for each here, the for each loop is, is essentially the same as this code here. I wrote it out here by hand, where we call get enumerator on our enumerable, and then we ca keep calling move next, and as long as it has a next item, then it gets the current item and writes it out. Now what's interesting here, just a little side note, is this move next method. This is what is used to call back into that state machine. So the first time when we call that get enumerator, it's actually creating a state machine, lifting it onto the heap and all that. Um, and then when we call move next, we're calling into that state machine, which is our method all chopped up here. Now, the move next method is funny because this is actually very similar to how async and await works. Um, it, it lifts all of your local methods out into a state machine, and it chops up your method at every await point. Right? So it's very, very similar to this. And in fact, I'm sure that we've all seen the call stacks when you have asynchronous code and you've got some exception coming out of that. Your exception call stack has all this dot move next stuff. And I've never actually um, confirmed this with Microsoft, but it's always been my suspicion that whoever did the async and await code took a look at it, at the problem that they were solving, and said, you know, we do almost the same thing with enumerables. I'm just going to copy paste that code. So copy paste for the win, and we end up with this move next in all of our async stack traces, which doesn't make any sense. It's really like, OK, do the next part of the state machine. But move next is actually coming from the enumerator world, where it's saying move to the next item. So cur curious little side note there. So if we run this through, spelled out, it works exactly the same way. So, oh, sorry, I forgot to show the asynchronous part. Of course, that's kind of important as well, isn't it? So let's forget this uh, basic stuff and jump into asynchronous enumerables. We're going to be in the asynchronous world the rest of the time here. So now I've got essentially the same thing, except here I have an asynchronous enumerable method. So it's returning an async enumerable. And in this case, I'm, I'm just doing something very simple just for the demo. I'm saying, you know, we're going to delay some amount of time. I'm reading this value from a database or whatever. And then I get that value. And then we're going to delay some amount of time and return the next value and, and so on for all three values. Now, when we consume this, we call it just the same way that we did with our, with our synchronous one. And we can use await for each. This is new syntax to C Sharp 8 that allows us to naturally consume asynchronous enumerables. So if I, or if I was to run this, now we're seeing that delay of a second uh, before each one. And I did it actually twice because I also spelled it out here. So the await for each, very similarly to how for each is expanded, uh, await for each is expanded into this kind of a block, where we're calling now get async enumerator. This one's different. The type of our enumerator is different, I async enumerable enumerator. And we now have a move next async method. So this is asynchronously asking the enumerator, do you have another thing? And the enumerator can now say, well, hold on, let me, let me you know, I got to wait for my result from the database first. The key here is that we're no longer just returning on the yield return. We're also returning on the await. There's two different ways that this method can be paused now. We have the old way with the enumerables, where we, where we yield returning a value. And then we have the, 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 the new way uh, with await, 
where, which, which works just the same as any other await, where that method is paused and it returns, uh, returns an incomplete task. So the key takeaway there is that we, are, we have both the deferred execution of an enumerable and we have the asynchronous pausing of an async method. This is, how, this is the, the basics of asynchronous streams. So let's talk a little bit more about how these things work asynchronously, like a, a, as a mental model. So with our old style enumerators, which I say old style, not meaning that they're deprecated in any way, but with the synchronous enumerators, uh, or generators, if you're in Python, or iterables, sorry, iterables are Python, generators are, are uh, JavaScript. Um, this gives you a, a, a deferred execution, right? They generate their values on demand. And you have a pull-based sequence. You can consume it with for each, which works just fine, uh, part of the language. With asynchronous streams, we still have these same things. We're still in a deferred execution. We're still pull-based. The only thing that really changes is that get next item is asynchronous. And, and it's called different things in different languages. Uh, Python and, and JavaScript have their own names for the asynchronous version of get next item. But under, under the hood, it, it, it all works very similarly in these, in these different languages. So for the most part, the move next async is just an implementation detail, but you might see it in your stack traces. Now, one thing that, uh, that asynchronous streams force you to do is it forces your consuming code to be asynchronous, right? just like any other asynchronous code. So any other async method using await, it's best if you, if you call it using await, and then that method has to be called using await, and so on, and async and await grows through your code base and infests your code, and that makes people hate it. Um, so, but but uh, asynchronous streams have the same problem, where it's asynchronous, so you have to call it asynchronously. So we it requires asynchronous consumers. If we look at the actual type definitions, these are, um, these are the, the type definitions for C Sharp um, in .NET. We have the enumerator type, which descends from iDisposable, just in case it needs to dispose something. Most enumerables do not. But just in case it needs to dispose something, and then we have that move next, which moves to the next item if possible, returns false if, if there's no more items. And then we have current to get the current item. Asynchronously is very similar, where we have, we have current to get the current item. We have a move next async, which, um, which returns a promise of Boolean, here using value task. We'll talk about value task in just a minute. And the async enumerable, or async enumerator, is also async disposable. And this is something else that's new in C-sharp 8, is this whole asynchronous disposal thing. Um, we're not going to get into asynchronous disposal today, uh, but just in a quick summary, we need async disposable support for, to have async streams because you can have a try catch or a try finally in your enumerator block, and inside of that catcher finally, you can await something. So in order to actually clean up uh, your asynchronous enumerable, uh, generally speaking, you need to support asynchronous disposal as well. So th that's all we're going to say about asynchronous disposal uh, in this talk. We're focusing on asynchronous streams. And for this talk, async disposable is just used to support asynchronous streams. I'm going to spend a few more minutes talking about value tasks, because it is important that we learn a new way of thinking about tasks when we see value task. Now, you can think of value task as a more efficient task. And this is especially true if the result is, is often synchronous. But it comes with a couple of restrictions. Number one, you can only consume it once. And when I say consume, I mean you can just consume it either using a wait or you can use .as task to convert it into a task. But you can only do that one time. The reason for this is value tasks are actually a value type, but they can also be reused. So once you consume a value task, the, the producer can actually reuse that value task, and now it means something else. 
So this is something that trips up people if they're, if they're used to saying, you know, await you know, this task, and then further on down, if they await the task again, then that doesn't work with value task. And other properties also are a little bit different. Result, in particular. Um, and this one is a, is a particularly bad gotcha because value task is actually not new in .NET Core 3. It's been out since .NET Core 2.1 or 2.2. I don't remember exactly. But it, it's been out for a little while. And so, uh, but, but the way value task used to work is it's either um, synchronously completed or it's wrapping a task. And now there's a third option. Value task can also wrap something else and actually be reused. So now we've got like these additional pitfalls that weren't there before. So one of, one of the things that, that, you, that you have to watch out for here is result will not block, right? Unless it just happens to be wrapping a task. And then it'll just happen to work, even though the code is wrong. Um, and then if a library or API updates later and makes it a reusable value task, then the code stops working. So result, you actually can't call dot result on a value task until the value task has completed. Like I said, there are certain situations where it'll work today, but you do not want to depend on that. It's an implementation detail of whatever API you're calling. Now, this is only necessary if you're consuming value tasks directly. But that is going to be start becoming more and more common now that .NET Core 3.0 is out. The compiler generated code for the for each await um, we'll always do the same. We'll always do the right thing for asynchronous streams. It'll never violate these rules. But when you're consuming value tasks yourself, you have to keep these in mind. One other final note on value task. Um, Mark Gravel wrote a, a great blog post saying everybody should use value task. And I agree eventually. I'm not sure if I agree right now. And the reason is a lot of developers aren't aware of these pitfalls with value task. And so I see a lot of questions already starting to, to crop up uh, left and right saying, well, I'm, I'm, I've, I've converted my code over to using value task from task, and now it doesn't work. You know, the, the, I called that result, and it, it's not working right anymore. Well, yeah, because you can't do that in the value task world. So the code will compile. It just won't behave as expected. So until, until uh, Developers become more comfortable with value task and the pitfalls that it has. I can't say use it everywhere. Mark Ravel is on a team, a uh, top-notch team. Um, they're working on something very performance, or that requires a lot of performance. So for his team, it makes sense to adopt value task. Is that true across the whole .NET ecosystem? I think not yet, but it is coming. So let's. Uh, just uh, real quickly, this is something that, that we saw in the demo, um, where the for each is expanded out into get enumerator. This is the synchronous enumer enumerator example. The async enumerator is very, very similar. We saw this in the demo as well. Uh, one thing we did not see in the demo is how configure await fall or how configure await works. You can actually call await for each configure await false. Um, so you, you just stick configure await false right on the end of your, your asynchronous stream. And in that case, it actually generates an await using configure await false so that uh, asynchronous disposable also gets a configure await false. And then the move next async also gets configure await false. So when you use configure await false once in the await for each, it is actually used everywhere that await is, is generated inside of that, inside of that method. So configure await false. I'm, I'm assuming everyone knows what that means. This is, this, I probably shouldn't do that. Um, is, is where asynchronous code await normally resumes in a context, captures a context, and then resumes in that context. Configure await false is a way of saying, don't resume in the current context. I want you to always come back on the thread pool thread. So real briefly, let's, talk a look, let's take a look at uh, creating asynchronous streams, and then we'll get more into the practical application of when would I want to use this, and what are some of the tools that are available for uh, consuming asynchronous streams. Asynchronous streams are supported in several different languages, as I said, um, and each language has their own particular way of 
of creating them and consuming them. We already looked at some examples of creating asynchronous streams in C Sharp. And then we also have uh, consuming asynchronous streams. In C Sharp, again, we use await for each. In JavaScript, we use for each await. That's not going to confuse anybody, I'm sure. Um, I've already messed it up so many times. <laughs> uh, one, of the, one of the nice things about using uh, these existing constructs around generators and async and await and just kind of combining them is that exceptions actually work exactly as you would expect them to do. There's quite a bit of work going on behind the scenes to make sure that exceptions are handled the way that we expect. But exceptions are deferred, just like any other enumerable or generator. We're still de in the deferred world in async enumerables. And they also propagate naturally. So you can catch uh, exceptions using try catch just around your await for each, just like you would anywhere else in any other asynchronous code. And you catch them naturally. There's no exception wrappers or anything weird like that. So it's a very natural consumption for asynchronous, enum asynchronous enumerables. So let's talk a little bit about what I consider the most primary use case, and that is a paging API. Now, when I talk about a paging API, I mean an API that returns only a certain number of items. Now, pretty much every API in the world is like this, because you don't want somebody, some, whether yourself or some other consumer, <laughs> To, to call and say, yeah, pass me 50 million items back in this HTTP response. Um, so so almost every real-world API has some kind of limiting built into it. And here I'm using the example of I have a limit, which is the number of items to return, and an offset, which is essentially saying start at this item. Right? So between these two, start at this item, return me this number of items. This is one way to do paging. Um, another way is to have like a next pointer, so you return. Here's the URL that you want to hit if you, if you want the next part of this result set. So it, it doesn't really matter which pattern you're using. Uh, asynchronous streams work just fine with both. So I am actually already running this server on my, on my laptop here. And this one is delaying for three seconds, so it's getting the values from the database. right? And then I return up to 13 items from 0 to 12, uh, skipping over the offset, only taking a certain number of limit. So this is essentially just doing paging over 12 items. Now, if I switch back to my demo and take a look at what this looks like in the consuming code, this is a console application. Now it's going to talk to that API. And all right, so, so first off, this, uh, this main method is just going to do an await for each call over this asynchronous stream. And I'm going to build an asynchronous stream around this API. That's the, that, an asynchronous API stream is the kind of API that I want to consume this with. And this is what that looks like. So I'm going to set a page size of 5. The API defaults to 10, but we're going to use 5. Only 5 items are going to be returned at a time starting at offset 0, of course. And then we get each page of results. We pull them out of the JSON. And then we return all of, the res all of these results. Now, this is a very common style of asynchronous streams, which is you're doing some asynchronous work. And then you don't just have one thing to return. You have like a whole batch of things to return. Right? And that's actually why the asynchronous streams interface, the I async enumerable, returns a value task of bool instead of a task of bool. Because a lot of the time, uh, if, we're, if we call this, uh, how many items are going to be returned? 12. We're returning 12 items, but there's only going to be three, four, five, five network calls. And other than that, all the items are going to be synchronous. So four out of five items that we're returning here are actually going to be returned synchronously instead of asynchronously. So the rest of this code is, is pretty obvious. We're stopping at the end, and we move to the next page when we're ready. So if we run this code, we see the three-second delay, and then we're going to get five items all at once, synchronously. And then there's another three-second delay, and then five items at once, another three-second delay, and then the last three items.
So that is pretty much the um, that's that's pretty much the, the main use case for the paging API, or a paging API is really like the main use case that I see for asynchronous streams. Not saying that there aren't other ones, but paging APIs are used everywhere, right? Not only APIs, but database calls. Um, very, very commonly use, uh, use a paging system as well. Um, also of note here that there's an anti-use case. And this is because asynchronous streams do not replace observables. Um, if you have something that, is, that follows a pattern that is more applicable to observables, then that is what we should use. So like SignalR. With SignalR or WebSockets, uh, we connect first. And then we can get any number of messages. And they're thrown at us. We have no, we have no way of saying, OK, now give me the next message. All right, give me the next message. Um, instead, these messages just arrive whenever they arrive. So we, we get these messages thrown at us, and then we eventually disconnect. There's a, there's a, a fairly common thing, with, uh, particularly with stock quotes, where they, they kind of use a sort of HTTP API, but not quite, where they, you know, they establish a regular HTTP connection, but then they send multiple responses, because they don't want everybody connecting and disconnecting all the time. Um, so, they, so they establish one HTTP connection, and then send multiple responses over that same, re same connection. So again, you have the same kind of thing. You're connecting to a socket. You get multiple responses. You have no control over when they come in. They just arrive whenever they do. And then you disconnect. And anything that follows this subscribe, multiple updates, unsubscribe pattern is not the best fit for asynchronous streams. Instead, you want to, do, to use observables because they are, these systems are naturally push-based. Now, you can make them pull-based, right? If you want to do that, and depending on your use case, you might want to, because observables are harder to use. Just being honest here. Observables are harder to use than asynchronous streams. So if you want to, to convert something that's naturally push-based into asynchronous streams, then what you want to do is, is put some kind of a buffer in there so that these things can arrive whenever they want, and then your code can choose when to asynchronously pull them out of that buffer. The best buffer I would always recommend is uh, system threading channels system.threading.channels. It's on NuGet from Microsoft. And it is an asynchronous first producer-consumer queue of sorts. So you can hook this up to an API like this and say, well, just shove whatever things you get you know, into this buffer. And then the rest of your code can just asynchronously consume that buffer. And in fact, Channels has a natural asynchronous streams API. So you can just say, read all async. And that is an asynchronous stream. It's a very natural fit. Uh, for this kind of scenario. So I want to talk a little bit more about using async streams in the real world and what it looks like. Um, can we stay into that asynchronous streams monad a little bit longer before we pull everything out with for each await? And there, we can. There's a whole link uh, system over here. We have link to objects. We've got link to SQL, which is really old now, link to entities, um, link to events, which is observables. And now we also have link to uh, asynchronous streams. Now, this is a community project. It is not Microsoft supported in spite of the name. I don't know how they got the name, system.link.async. Certainly sounds like a Microsoft project, but it's actually not. Um, and it gives us all of the normal stuff that we're used to using in the, ace, in, in, uh, in the link world, but for asynchronous streams. Let's uh, take a look at slow range first. So I defined this uh, slow range, and I'm going to use this in, in a number of, of examples here, where it just counts up to 10, and each time it delays a little bit longer. So this is, this is an, an asynchronous stream that slows down as it goes along. For our first demo here, I'm just calling slow range. And then I can call this link method dot where. Now, this is not built into .NET Core 3. There's no dot where or anything like that. Um, there's no link support built into .NET. You have to, ex to install that extra NuGet package. But here I'm just saying, give me all the numbers that are even. And if I run this, we'll see that it's executing. 
fast at first, and then it slows down as it gets closer and closer to the end of the sequence, and then it's done. So that's the basic link um, then gives us all of the operators that we're used to dealing with with link. Oops. Now there's, there's also a lot more that we can do with asynchronous link. In particular, what we usually want to do with asynchronous link is actually give it asynchronous work to do as part of its operators. So link to link to streams, that's a really bad way to title that. But link to asynchronous streams um, allows us to pass in asynchronous lambdas. So we can actually pass an asynchronous method into where. Um, now these have a, a suffix that no one likes. They put a suffix of a wait on there. And the way that I like to think about it is that th this, the uh, where await will await the lambda that you pass to it. Okay, so that, that's how I kind of make that make sense in my mind, is that a wait suffix means that they're going to await whatever we pass in. So we can pass in asynchronous methods to something like where or count. Speaking of count, there's also a way of uh, so, some link operators return async enumerable, so they're still enumerable. Other link operators return a single value. So we're exiting the monad at that point. These terminal operators, they end in async. And these ones you can, you can await yourself. For example, count async. You can, uh, we can do a dot count async on that asynchronous enumerable, and it will count up all the things asynchronously. Now there's no dot count, right? Because that would be synchronous, but we have an asynchronous source, so we can't do that. But there is a count async which we can call and then await. And then if you really want to get too complicated, um, they also have overloads for both. We can pass in an asynchronous method, and it'll return an asynchronous uh, result, which we can await. Just one final note here is that all of these link operators, this is a common question with asynchronous streams and link, is that, you know, is it doing any kind of concurrency? Right? As it's getting these asynchronous values, it, if I'm doing like a, a where await, you know, saying as I get each one of these asynchronous values from the stream, go look it up in an API or something and get me some additional value for that and then return it. Um, if I'm doing something like that with a where await then, or a select await, then is that ever doing any concurrency? You know, is it getting multiple values and calling that API multiple times before returning the next value? And the answer is no. These are all uh, serial, so one item at a time. There's actually no concurrency or parallelism built in. So just to show what these look like, I've got the slow range here, and here where I'm passing an asynchronous lambda into where, and this is a very common question um, that people have with link and have and have asked it for years is how can I do an asynchronous filter or an asynchronous select and all these things? And so far the answer has always been, well you can't, because you, you, there's no there was no such thing as asynchronous streams before. Well now you can. Uh, if you have an asynchronous stream like the slow range, the same one we saw before, now I can call uh, dot where await on that and pass in an asynchronous method. And this method adds uh, 0 0.1 seconds to each each item, which I, I, you can tell right there, that, it's, that each one's about a tenth of a second slower. I'm just kidding, you can't tell that. Um, so, so we can pass in asynchronous methods, or asynchronous lambdas, into our operators that end in await. Nobody likes this naming syntax, but to avoid any kind of possible uh, overload conflicts, this is what they went with. So where await? And then similarly, we have the terminal methods, or leaving the monad. If we want to count all of these things asynchronously, uh, this is, we're not passing in an asynchronous lambda here. I'm just counting the things that are, the ones that are even. But it has to be asynchronous because our source is asynchronous. And then finally, we can also pass in an asynchronous method to 
the count operator, and in this case our overload is the extremely awkward count await async. It's because it has both suffixes. It's got the await suffix because it's awaiting this lambda, and then it's got an async suffix because it's returning a value instead of an enumerable. So one of the things that we can do with asynchronous enumerables is take a regular enumerable, so some existing link method that we have, and if we want to use an asynchronous lambda, for example, we have some kind of set of values or whatever. Uh, maybe they're even in a list, which is also an enumerable. Um, so if we have something that, that's synchronous, that's already there, and we want to look things up one at a time, for example, um, or filter them. I'm going to use an example of filtering with the where operator. And I want to filter these things asynchronously. I want to look each one up in an in a API or in a, in a database. We can actually call to async enumerable. And what this gives us, it lifts the, uh, the regular enumerable into an async enumerable. Now, it's still synchronous. It's, it's, uh, we're, not, we're not changing the nature of this, uh, of this enumerable. It's still synchronous, but it has now the, a the asynchronous API, so we can use it with all of these expanded link operators that we have for asynchronous streams. So let's take a look at that real quickly, what that looks like. And that is, so I'm going to go ahead and run this one. So our code, let's say, has this kind of an enumerable. And this is a synchronous one. It's data that we already have in memory. And we want to do some kind of an asynchronous filtering on it. In this case, I'm just having an arbitrary delay, asynchronous delay, and then just taking the even ones. You can tell I like even numbers. Um, and then what this does, so, so we call dot two async enumerable uh, to lift that existing enumerable into an asynchronous stream. And then we have all of these additional operator overloads available, like dot where await, where we can pass in an asynchronous lambda. So when we run this, it's going to filter out each one of those things exactly like it did before. Um, this time, starting from a synchronous enumerable, lifting it to asynchronous enumerables, and applying an asynchronous filter. So let's talk about cancellation. And this is where, this is, this is all C Sharp specific, this part of the talk. Everything up until this point has kind of existed in other languages to, to, to a certain extent. Uh, JavaScript doesn't really have a lot of link support. Um, so even things like underscore and, and libraries like that don't have any kind of support, as far as I'm aware, for, um, for asynchronous generators. There's nothing that's been kind of widely adopted in JavaScript that's like link support for asynchronous, asynchronous enumerables. Um, Python does have support in the IDER tools library uh, in the Python world. We do have uh, the ability to have like all of the dot filter and all of that work with asynchronous enumerables. Just, and, and it's really just the same as what we just saw in the C sharp uh, .NET world. Now, cancellation is something that is very .NET specific. Uh, so this whole section it doesn't apply to any other languages. Basically, if we want to take uh, cancellation in our asynchronous enumerable, we take a cancellation token, just like any other API in the world in .NET. Um, we take that same kind of cancellation token. There is a new attribute that we have to stick on it. And I'll, I'll explain why in just a moment. But uh, Microsoft uh, Visual Studio will remind you if you forget it. So it's, it's, you, don't, you don't have to like, really think about it. Visual Studio will say, oh, yeah, you know, you forgot that attribute. You need an attribute here. Um, so why don't they just add it automatically? I don't know. I don't know. Um, so we have a, um, to, to cancel a, 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 an asynchronous stream, we, pa we can either pass a cancellation token to the actual method. I'm going to show the code here, because I think it's e this is easier to understand in code. But you, you can either pass a token directly, which is like the more natural way. But then there's also like an advanced way. Uh, a more complicated way. 
wh where we use a new extension method called with cancellation. And the core reason there is because the thing that is cancelable is not an enumerable, it's the enumerator. And we'll look at that in this demo. Kinda. So let's look at simple cancellation first. So now I have that slow range from earlier, I'm now making cancelable. So I have a cancelable slow range. And you know, just to uh, show this here. If you do forget that attribute, there you go, Visual Studio. And it says, can't really read it, I will read it. The async iterator has one or more parameters of type cancellation token, but none of them is deco decorated with the enumerator cancellation attribute. Yes, a rather complicated say, way of saying, you forgot your attribute there. So it, Visual Studio, that's built right in, uh, will tell you, will remind you that you need this attribute here. So I'm, I'm building a cancelable slow range, and this is exactly like the one before, except that I'm only delaying a tenth of a second here for each one, and this is a cancelable delay. So if this is a, a database call or an API call, I'm just passing that cancellation token down. This is the standard way to implement cancellation in .NET. The only thing that's new is this attribute. Now consuming it, uh, I'm going to start uh, a cancellation token, go and trigger it after three seconds, um, and then just iterate through this asynchronously. And it will get up to about seven, didn't get to 10, and then it got canceled. Now this, um, this method, this, or the, this exception, the task canceled exception, works just exactly the same way as any other exception would in asynchronous streams. And this task canceled exception is exactly what we do expect from using cancellation tokens. So this is, basic cancellation. And here, I'm, when I call the cancelable slow range, I'm passing this token in directly. So this token actually gets that value and then is passed to the task.delay. Now, so, so why need the attribute, right? What, what's the whole point behind that is the question. And that's necessary in the more advanced cancellation scenario where you have something like this. Let's say that I have my own operator, right? So I'm going to um, define an operator that I, wa I want to say, I want to take everything from this sequence and display it on the console, but I only want to do this for about three seconds. Now, you can pass any sequence into here. This is any asynchronous stream. So this is an operator that doesn't care what, what kind of, uh, generator, what kind of enumerable that you're passing to it. Um, it wants to just take everything from there just for three seconds. And so it uses this dot with cancellation extension method. Now when the compiler sees this, and it, and it generates the code for this, when the compiler um, is, is taking this apart, it'll say, all right, you've got that with cancellation method. All right, in that case, I'm going to take this token right here, and I'm going to pass that in into your enumerator cancellation. And it finds this argument based on that attribute to pass that in. When we consume it, the complex cancellation, the consuming code says, all right, give me a cancelable slow range, does not pass the cancellation token, because it doesn't know it, right? The consuming co code doesn't need to be aware of what the timeout is. That's, that's for this other code, this other method to worry about. The consuming code, is saying, I just want this asynchronous stream. Now you uh, consume sequence with timeout. I want you to pass it your own cancellation token. And so this is what, what uh, the, the attribute is what enables this kind of handoff, where we're saying, all right, pass this. So, so we're, we're creating an enumerable here. This enumerable, remember, is not cancelable. So it actually doesn't really make sense to pass a cancellation token to it. Um, 
So we're, we're not passing a cancellation token here. We're just saying give me back an enumerable, asynchronous enumerable. And then this consume sequence with timeout comes in here. The await for each uses an asynchronous enumerator. It pulls the get asynchronous get async enumerator out from this items. And then it says, oh, and then use this cancellation token. The enumerator is what is cancelable, not the enumerator. And so in situations like this, where you have an enumerator that you need to cancel, that's why that attribute is necessary. It enables the compiler to say, OK, I'm going to take this token and stick it in into the enumerators generated by that enumerable. So that's a more advanced uh, version. There's also another example is like if you have like a zip operator where you're taking, you have two sources and you're taking one item from each one asynchronously, of course, uh, and then if, and, and yielding, um, yielding like a, like a tuple of them, then if you want to stop that, if you want to stop yours, that, that, that operator, as soon as one of them finishes, you also want to cancel the other one. So in that case, you could have a cancellation token, pass it to both of them, both of the enumerators, and then when one of them finishes, you cancel the other one. Because you don't, you don't need any more of those requests. They're not going to matter anyway. Your operator is already done. So these are the kind of situations where you want to use uh, cancellation with that specific cancellation attribute. And that's why that attribute exists there. <clears throat> 